Good morning, family. Good morning. Good morning. Now, I know in the month of November, we uh, recently celebrated Veterans Day, if I'm not mistaken. And my husband always looks at me sideways when I'm too slow to say, Happy Veterans Day, and I thank you for your service. Now, I know I'm a little ahead of myself because my my uh, sister up here just gave me, you know, when you have people that keep you informed on the down low. So, like, I got some information as I was talking to you that's now going to change what I need to say. So, I thank you for that, sister. But I'm reminded, even as we are approaching Veterans Day, that my family pretty much is a military family, and I've never wanted to do the Army thing. Mm -mm. I don't want nobody telling me what to do. I don't want nobody telling me when to get up. I don't want nobody telling me where I got to go. So most of my family went. I went to school. They went to the military. But guess what? Guess what? I'm happy to stand here this morning to tell you I'm not a military fan, but I get joy serving in the Army of the Lord. <laughs> so church, arise. And hear the call of our captain, who is Christ Jesus, our opening song. Please stand and join us this morning. sword that makes the wounded whole. We will fight with faith and valor. When faced with trials on every side, we know the outcome is secure. And Christ will have the prize for which he died, an inheritance of nations. Come see the cross where love and mercy meet As the Son of God is stricken Then see his foes lie crushed beneath his feet With the conqueror who has risen And as the stone is rolled away And Christ emerges from this victory march continues till the day every eye and heart shall see him so spirit come put strength in every stride give grace for every hurdle that we may run with faith to win the prize of a servant good and faithful as saints of old still line the way retelling triumphs of his grace we hear their calls and hunger for the day when with Christ we stand in glory we hear their calls and hunger Good morning, church. Good morning. God bless you. It's good to see you. Good to see this crowd here today. Amen. 
If you are here for the first time or for the first time in a long time, we would love to connect with you, and we do it using the connection card, which you'll find in the little pocket in the seat right in front of you. Uh, we would ask you to give us your basic information, name, uh, email address is actually more important than your physical address, and uh, your phone number, if you're willing to do that, we would uh, love to be able to connect with you in that way. The connection card is vital to us to be able to see you, know you, uh, follow up with you. It's also wonderful for uh, asking for information. You can ask for information about your relationship with Christ, about whether or not you've been baptized and would like to be, information about joining the church, and so on. You can offer a prayer request, which we pray for uh, regularly and also during our uh, once-a-month prayer meeting. You'll see on the back of the connection card at the very bottom, it says key word. And sometimes we'll give you an announcement and say, if you're interested, write the key word down on the card and turn it in. We use this mostly when we're seeing who wants to join the membership class, right? And you write discover in the key word slot. The membership class is coming up on the 3rd of December. So just the beginning of next month, if you're interested in membership, we ask you to gather on that Saturday morning. We walk you through our membership materials. We tell you about the mission and vision of our church. And if you sign the covenant saying, yes, I want to be a member, you are voted in the following day on Sunday at the regular quarterly business meeting. So if you are interested in membership, write Discover on the bottom of a connection card and turn it in the offering plate or at one of the boxes near the doors. I want to mention a few more things, and then we're going to pray and get right back to worship. This is the time when we're collecting our Operation Christmas Child shoeboxes. There are still a few left on the counter if you want to take one, but they have to be back by the 13th of this month. If you've got a box and you haven't done your, you know, dollar store shopping yet, they have to be back by the 13th. So keep that in mind. Most of you, if you're on our mailing list, received an email announcing that on the 20th, we will have a special business meeting to present the 2023 budget. A lot of work is going into preparing the budget. This is your first chance to see it, ask questions, make suggestions, and, and all of that happens at, after church on the 20th. And then when the budget is presented on the 4th of December, it is presented without discussion for an up and down vote. So if you're interested in the budget, stay for the special meeting on the 20th. One last announcement. It's Medicare enrollment time, and if you just want to talk to someone about available plans, Elaine does that. So sign up with Elaine at, a, uh, at the connection counter. She's not going to enroll you in any plans. She's not a salesperson, but she has expertise, and she will walk you through your options just to help you make a better decision. Does that make sense? Come on, yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. We like to help uh, everybody out, and uh, I appreciate Elaine for doing that sort of thing. Let's bow for a word of prayer. God, I thank you for your presence here with us today in the person of your Holy Spirit. It is our goal to honor you today and to give you praise and to... Uh, open up our hearts and be moved by you to make decisions about our lives. We, God, we want to be pleasing to you, and we want to do your will. We pray, God, that as uh, the word of God is proclaimed, that your Holy Spirit will have a special message for every heart who hears it here in this room and as it goes out uh, over the Internet later. God, be with our singers. Be with our worshipers.
We want to hear from you. We want to dedicate ourselves to you. Thank, for, thank you for all you're doing here in this place today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So family, does anybody here have seatbelt songs? <laughs> yeah, seat seatbelt songs, you know, strap in for security. Okay, the reason why I ask is because this next song for me is a seatbelt song. Because generally, if I don't strap in before I sing it, I'm ready to run and jump and leap and go crazy because this song is about joy in Jesus. And guess what? I've got Jesus. So I've got joy. Please stand and join me. And for those of you that need to put on your seatbelts, you may do so at this time. Steve. I've got joy in the struggle. I've got peace in the storm. I've got strength in the battle. I don't fear anymore. I'm a child of heaven and my hope is secure. I've got joy because I've got Jesus. He gave me beauty for ashes, turned my life around. He broke my chains and now dry bones rise up out of that grave he has all of my worship all my honor and praise I've got joy cause I've got Jesus he gave me beauty for ashes turned my life around he broke my chains and now I dance on solid ground for all he's done to save me It's just a matter of knowing it. No Jesus, no joy. Amen. K-N, I mean, N-O, no Jesus, N-O, no joy. So we're going to continue with the joy in the house of the Lord today. Amen. That's I've got joy.
won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. Oh, we shout out your praise. Oh, there we go. We worship a God who was. We worship a God who is. We worship a God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors. He parted the raging sea. My God, he holds the victory. Yeah. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. Come on now. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. Oh, we shout out your praise. Oh, we sing to the God who heals. We sing to the God who saves. God who always makes a way cause he hung up on that cross then he rose up from that grave my God still rolling stones away there's joy in the house of the Lord there's joy in the house of the Lord today and we won't be quiet we shout out your praise there's joy in the house of the Lord our God is sure and we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. Oh, we shout out your praise. Oh, here's why. Because we were the beggars. Now we're royalty. We were the prisoners. Now we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted, received by his grace. Let the house of the Lord sing praise. Hallelujah. Because we were the beggars. Now we're royalty. We were the prisoners. Now we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by his grace. Let the house of the Lord sing praise. Come on. There's joy. There's joy in the house of the Lord of the Lord today and we won't be quiet we shout out your praise there's joy in the house of the Lord our God is surely in this place and we won't be quiet we shout out your praise oh we shout out your praise amen joy in the house of the Lord hallelujah All because of Jesus. Amen? Amen. 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 Come on, y'all. I said there's joy in the house of the Lord. I'm having a hard time believing that. Yeah. Now, I can't God. see your hearts. I can only see your testimony. Is there joy in the house of the Lord? Amen? Amen. Joy in the house of the Lord. Amen. Give that testimony. Let somebody know next to you it's real. It's not a song. It's not a song. Jesus is joy. And if you've got Jesus, you've got joy. And the house of the Lord is the place where we come to praise him for the Jesus that he's given. For the Jesus that is available yes. to those who will receive him today, tomorrow, and forevermore. Jesus is joy. And having said that, the desire of every believer ought to be that God will abide with in. Abide with me, Lord. We're going to slow it down just a little bit with reverence. Abide with me. Oh, 
swift to its close ebbs out life's little day earth's joy grows dim its glories pass away change and decay in all around I see My guide and stay can be Through clouds and sunshine Oh, abide with me I fear no foe With thee at hand to bless children in life in death oh lord abide with me oh thou who changes not oh thou who changes not abide with me Please join me as we humble our spirits and speak to our Heavenly Father who loves us and will hear our cry. Dear Heavenly Father, it is my prayer this morning that you abide with me. It is my prayer this morning as intercessor, that you would abide with my church family. So, Lord, I stand here today to ask that you would abide with us. We need your presence and your power every passing day. We see the gloom of darkness closing in on this sinful world and yet you has given all of us a light that can shine in the midst of this darkness you've given us a light that can push away the darkness which allows a path to the cross to be seen by all of those in darkness who know you not so today Lord we pray that you would shine our light in the darkness, that someone might be healed, that someone might be saved, that someone might be set free to become a disciple of obedience to your word through Jesus Christ. Lord, we ask now that you would open our hearts, 
that we receive, not the messenger, but the message. Because it is your word that gives life sustaining, life eternal, and life abundant here on earth. And so we pray that you will help our hearts to receive that which you have prepared today. Bless us and keep us ever aspiring in the unity and the bond of Christ in this sanctuary and this place of worship and this place of Zion, the First Baptist Church of Beverly Hills. In Jesus' name I pray and do believe. Amen. Thank you, worship team. Praise God. Well, the title of my message today, as you can see, is Trusting God in Times of Transition. And the reason I'm preaching this message today should be fairly obvious. As a church, we are entering into a time of transition, a time of change. Pastor Marple has served this church for over 16 years. Amen. With his retirement, we are entering into a search for new leadership in the next chapter in the life of our church. In the words of Sam Cook, I know a change is going to come. But I want you to know before I go any farther that the biblical principles that I will lay down for you today can have a much broader context and be applied in many more situations than just the situation facing our church today. These are biblical principles, which means that they state spiritual truths. Biblical principles can be applied in many situations in life. And the wonderful thing about the truth of the Word of God is that the truth is always true. Amen. Anytime a young person goes off to college, graduates, gets a new job, gets married, these are times of transition. And change. Anytime a person leaves their current job for a new one or decides on a whole new career path or retires, that's a time of transition. Whenever someone makes a major life move, that's a time of transition. Now, personally, When I graduated college here in Florida, I moved to Kentucky to go to seminary. Transition. Then I took my first pastorate. Huge transition. A few years later, we adopted our first daughter, Deborah. Becoming parents. That's a huge transition. Graduated, took a church in Florida. Had a second daughter, Megan. Things didn't work out in Florida. We moved to Texas. After a few years in Texas, we took our church in upstate New York. All of that was in a period of just 11 years. Transition, 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 transition. And I might add that not all transitions in life are happy ones. Some are quite painful. Divorce is a painful transition. Sudden job loss is a painful transition. A bad medical diagnosis is a painful transition. Death of a loved one is the hardest transition of all. And I want you to know that if you are a believer, that God will walk you through all of them. Nothing in your life catches God by surprise. He saw it all coming. And the Holy Spirit will use the word of God to get you safely through to the other side. And speaking of getting safely through to the other side, look at our, let's look at our scripture for today. 
starting in the third chapter of the book of Joshua. Now, this passage is all of Joshua 3 in the first seven verses of Joshua 4. So it's a long passage. Here in our church, we stand for the reading of God's Word. If, if you could stand for a chapter and a half, then I invite you to do that. If not, don't feel bad about sitting down. But we're going to read from the Word of God, Joshua 3, and part of chapter 4. Those of you who will, uh, please stand for the reading of God's Word. Then Joshua rose early in the morning. And they set out from Shittim, and they came to the Jordan, he and all the people of Israel, and lodged there before they passed over. And at the end of three days, the officers went through the camp and commanded the people, As soon as you see the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God being carried by the Levitical priests, then you shall set out from your place and follow it. You, uh, yet there shall be a distance between you and it, about 2,000 cubits in length. Do not come near it, in order that you may know the way you shall go, for you have not passed this way before. And then Joshua said to the people, Consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. And Joshua said to the priest, take up the Ark of the Covenant and pass on before the people. And so they took up the Ark of the Covenant and went before the people. The Lord said to Joshua, today I will begin to exalt you in the sight of all Israel, that they may know that as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. And as for you, command the priests who bear the Ark of the Covenant, when you come to the brink of the waters of the Jordan, you shall stand still in the Jordan. Joshua said to the people of Israel, come here and listen to the words of the Lord your God. And Joshua said, here is how you shall know that the living God is among you that he will without fail drive out from before you the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Hivites, the Perizzites, the Girgashites, the Amorites, the Jebusites. How many people thought I couldn't do that? <laughs> Behold, the ark of the covenant of the Lord of all the earth is passing over before you into the Jordan. Now, therefore, take twelve men from the tribes of Israel, from each tribe a man, and when the soles of the feet of the priests bearing the Ark of the Covenant, the Lord of all the earth, shall rest in the waters of the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan shall be cut off from flowing, and the waters coming down from above shall stand in one heap. So when the uh, people set out from their tents to pass over the Jordan, with the priests bearing the Ark of the Covenant before the people. And as soon as those bearing the Ark had come as far as the Jordan, and the feet of the priests bearing the Ark were dipped in the brink of the water, now the Jordan overflows its banks throughout the time of harvest. The waters coming down from above stood and rose up in a heap very far away at Adam, the city that is beside Zarathan, and those flowing down toward the Sea of the Aravah, the Salt Sea, were completely cut off. Here it is. And the people passed over opposite Jericho. Now the priests bearing the Ark of the Covenant, the Lord stood firmly on dry ground in the midst of the Jordan. And all Israel passed over on dry ground until all the nation finished passing over the Jordan. When all the nation had finished passing over the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, Take twelve men from the people, from each tribe a man, and command them, saying, Take twelve stones from here out of the midst of the Jordan, from the very place where the priest's feet stood firmly, and bring them over with you and lay them down in the place where you lodge tonight. And then Joshua called the twelve men from the people of Israel, whom he had appointed, a man from each tribe. And Joshua said to them, Pass on before the ark of the Lord your God into the midst of the Jordan, and take up each of you a stone upon his shoulder, 
according to the number of the tribes of the people of Israel, that this may be a sign among you. And when your children ask in time to come, what do these stones mean to you? Then you shall tell them that the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. When it passed over the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. So these stones shall be to the people of Israel a memorial forever. May God bless the reading of his word. Be seated and we're, we're going to pray together. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your word. Thank you that it records not just something that happened a long, long time ago. But it is, the, the principles revealed in your word are absolutely current and up to date for this church today. And if we will take the principles of your word and not just hear them and not just know them, but apply them and, and walk in them, you will transform our lives. And I just pray, God, that, that that will happen here today, that by your Holy Spirit, you are already speaking to people's hearts. Because you want to do wonders in our midst today. If we'll just have faith to receive it and put it into practice. I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. What I'm going to lay out for you today is five biblical principles for a time of transition. This story in Joshua 3 and 4 is the crossing of the Jordan River into the land of Israel. In case you're not familiar with the story, I'll let you know what's going on. Forty years before, the nation of Israel came out of slavery in Egypt. They miraculously crossed the Red Sea to get out of Egypt. And here they are about to miraculously cross the Jordan River to get into the promised land. The nation of Israel had been wandering in the wilderness these past 40 years while the previous generation died off in the desert. The whole point of the story and the whole point of the book of Joshua, for that matter, is that their time of being led in the wilderness by God is ending, and they are embarking on a whole new adventure of taking hold of the promised land. This was a wonderful transition in the sense that God was fulfilling the great promise that he had made to them to give to them the land of promise but it was however also an absolutely frightening transition because now they had to be engaged in battle after battle to conquer the land by force, driving out the godless inhabitants of the land. The previous generation had failed in their faith and died in the desert because they had been too faithless and too frightened to go in and do what this generation was now called to do trust that the God who got them out could get them in. They had to believe in God. That he who delivered them out of their captivity would deliver them into the promised land. So here's the first principle. Number one, transitions are an opportunity to follow God into the unknown. Amen. Transitions are an opportunity to follow God into the unknown. As soon as you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God being carried by the Levitical priest, then you shall set out from your place and follow it in order that you may know the way you shall go, for you have not passed this way before. Let me tell you something about the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant is a long wooden box 
with a gold-covered lid. Now, this isn't just any box. The ark represented for the people of Israel the very presence of God in their midst. It contained the tablets of the Ten Commandments that God hand-carved and gave to Moses. It was so holy that no one was allowed to touch it. The Levitical priests were the only ones who were allowed to carry it. Otherwise, no one could even go near it. And it was built with six rings attached, three on either side, and the priest slid long poles through the rings and carried it by the poles. They couldn't even touch it themselves. And when the tabernacle was set up, this was their mobile worship center, the ark was put in the most holy place in the Holy of Holies, and there it represented the very throne of God on earth. The lid of the ark was called the mercy seat, and it was on this golden seat, this mercy seat, that the high priest would sprinkle the blood of the innocent sacrificial victim once a year on the day of atonement. But what you need to remember is that the ark represents the very presence of God. Now, notice the Israelites were told... When you see the ark being carried before you, follow it, for you have never passed this way before. What they're saying is the presence of God is going out before you, and you are to follow him because he knows that you don't know the way. I am very thankful that I serve an omniscient God. Amen. Omniscient means he knows everything. He knows what has happened to me in the past. He knows what I'm going through right now. He knows where I've been. And even better, he knows where I'm going. He knows what I know. And he knows what I don't know. And knowing what I don't know, he is willing to lead me into the unknown because he knows where he is going and all I have to do is trust and follow. This is one of my favorite sayings. One thing you never hear God say is, boy, I didn't see that coming. You've never heard him say it. Because God sees the end from the beginning. He knows everything that's going to happen. He knows where he is leading us, and we can trust him. And we can apply this to every area of our life and every time of transition. Did God know you were applying for that new job? Did he know when you were getting married? Did he know when you were going through that divorce? Did that bad diagnosis catch him by surprise? He saw it all beforehand. And he will absolutely lead you through it. If you are willing to trust him. And follow. Did God know in advance that this church was going to go through a leadership change? Amen. Of course he did. If for no other reason than because pastor prayed all the way through this and determined that this was God's will both for him and the church. This was not an accident or a mistake. This is God's ordained 
plan. And he is prepared to walk us all the way through if we are willing to follow, but you have to decide to follow God. Amen. Number two, transitions are a time for recommitment. Transitions are a time for recommitment. Consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things among you. Amen. Now notice what Joshua tells the people. This is a command. It's not a suggestion. It's not advice. This is a command. He tells them to consecrate themselves. And the Israelites knew what that meant because they had been commanded to consecrate themselves many times in the last 40 years. They knew what this meant. Now, the word consecrate means to make something holy. The Lord blessed the Sabbath day to make it holy. Same word. Consecrate, make holy. It's also translated sanctify and purify. And it means to set something apart to be completely dedicated to God. And Joshua tells the people, set yourselves apart to be completely dedicated to God. And that's a command. Now, for the people, this is what it looked like. All idols had to be forsaken. For some of us, that could take some time. All sins had to be repented and confessed to God. For some of us, that could take some time. All relationships had to be set right and reconciled. Prayers of devotion and surrender to God were said, and as an outward sign of their inward consecration, they washed their garments and put on clean clothes. What were they doing? They were committing or recommitting themselves completely to God. We've already said that times of transition are times for trusting God and following in obedience. They are also times for consecration and commitment. Amen. Now let's get down to something that's absolutely practical. As Christians, our first loyalty is to the Lord Jesus Christ. We are committed to him and surrendered to his lordship. He is our first priority. But also, as Christians, we are to remain loyalty, loyal to the church family where God has put us. Do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together, as is the habit of some. Amen. We live in a day where very few Christians remain loyal to their church family anymore. Right. We treat church like a consumer shopping for a new car. As a pastor, I've been told by people, we're just church shopping. Now, they don't mean anything by it, but do you know how insulting that is? So I would tell them, great, kick the tires, look under the hood, take us out for a spin. What happens when church members have a selfish, self-centered, godless consumer mindset and the pastor preaches a sermon or establishes a new direction that they don't like? They leave and go elsewhere. True. The worship leader quits and it takes a long time to find a new one. Well, let's go check out another church. One pastor leaves, and it takes a year to find a new one. Well, I think I'll take a break and come back when the new guy gets here. 
or the church stops doing Sunday school and starts forming life groups, or the leadership moves from a traditional service to a more contemporary one, or something just goes wrong in their minds, what do people do? They bail on their family and go shopping for a new one. I'm not lying, am I? I'm not making this stuff up. I served a church in New York for 15 years. And I had members in my church who were in their 80s and 90s. And our church had been their only church for their entire lives. I have this wonderful photo of the church choir that was taken in the 1940s. And some of the teenagers who were in the choir in the 40s were elders in my church when I came there in the 80s. They'd been in the church their whole lives. Now part of that was that they had never moved. But can you imagine being a member of the same church for 60 years? And in that time, they had had a dozen pastors and many more transitions and never once dreamed of leaving their family for another family. Transitions are times of consecration and recommitment to the Lord and to each other. Get prayed up. Repent and get right with God. And recommit to walk through this time with your family. Amen. Number three. Transitions require taking a step of faith. Transitions require taking a step of faith. Tell the priest to carry the Ark of the Covenant when you reach the edge of Jordan's waters Go stand in the river. Now, this is a great part of the story. The text tells us it was the time of the year when the Jordan River was at flood stage. Now, I've seen the Jordan. I was there in the winter. The Jordan River is not a mighty rushing stream. For much of its way, it is narrow, muddy, brown, and easily crossed. The Jordan River is not wide at all and not very deep. But in the spring of the year, two things happen. The snow on Mount Hermon melts, which feeds the river. And then there are the spring rains. And for a while, it becomes a raging torrent. And it was this time of year when Israel crossed the Jordan. But more than that, God intended to do a miracle in their midst. He had allowed them 40 years before to cross out of Egypt through the Red Sea on dry ground. And he intended to make them cross the Jordan on dry ground as well. The God who got them out was bringing them in. So Joshua commanded the priests of the tribe of Levi to carry the Ark of the Covenant to the edge of the rushing waters and then step into the water. Before the miracle came, they had to get their feet wet. He said, go and stand in the river. They had to take a step of faith in order to see their miracle. Okay, it's story time with Jim. These are not going to be in chronological order. I'm going to save the best one for last. We were living in Texas. And I was out of the ministry for a few years. And during that time, we were active at a local church. In fact, that's the church where I was ordained as a deacon. 
And during the two and a half years that we were there in Texas, I was a candidate as pastor or associate pastor in three different churches. And all three of them passed on me and went with another candidate. But we had been praying and asking and seeking and knocking for God to provide a church for us. And my best friend Phil, who was a army chaplain stationed at Fort Drum, called to tell me that he had given my resume to a church up there in upstate New York on the St. Lawrence River, which is the Canadian border. The church had been searching for over a year with no viable candidate. Is this what the Lord had for us? Well, the following week, the chair of the search team called, and it was just supposed to be a 10-minute conversation to see if my resume was still active and confirm that I was willing to consider the call. We talked for two hours. And as soon as we hung up, I said to my wife, start collecting boxes, we're moving to New York. And that was a step of faith. This was in October. In December, the church called, and we were there in January. Another time we were called to a church. We were serving in a church in South Florida, and we were called to a church in Tacoma, Washington, clear on the other side of the country. And at the time, we owned our first home, and we hadn't sold it yet, so we had to sell the house. And the time came for us to leave, to go to Washington, and the house hadn't sold yet. And so we committed this completely into God's hands, and we said, God, if this is your will, if this is your call on our lives, you're going to have to sell the house. That was our step of faith. And so we took off driving for the Pacific Northwest. As we arrived in Sheridan, Wyoming, on the third day of our journey, the realtor called and she said, we got a really good offer on the house. Where are you staying tonight? So she faxed the paperwork to our Holiday Inn and we signed it and faxed it back. The house was sold before we arrived in Tacoma the next day. Now, I promise you, the best till last. After 10 years of marriage, we had not been able to have children. And so we made the decision to adopt. We went with a private agency because the state agency had a waiting list of seven years. The adoption was going to cost $7,000. That was a third of our annual income. I was a student in the seminary. My wife taught school at a private Christian school. They don't pay anything, by the way. <laughs> $20,000 was our annual income. And the adoption was going to cost $7,000. So we just prayed and committed it into the Lord's hands and said, Lord, if you want this to happen, you're going to have to pay for it. That was our step of faith. Well, one afternoon, I was on the seminary campus on a day when I usually wasn't there, and I ran into a friend of mine, Bill Blanchard. And Bill said to me that he had just gotten his hospital bill following the birth of their son, and even after insurance, he owed $700. And I said, $700? Try 7,000. And I went on to explain that between agency fees and paying all of the birth mother's medical expenses out of pocket, the adoption was going to cost that much. And he thought for a second, and he said, Jim, we've got a girl in our church, and she's a teenager, and she lives with her mother and her younger sister. 
and she's pregnant. Boyfriend doesn't want anything to do with it. And she's already decided to put her baby up for adoption. And we have a lawyer in the church who's going to handle everything for free. Would you and your wife be interested? <laughs> yeah. This was God's answer. And a few weeks later, Pastor Bill calls me up and he says, Jim, I'm going to ask you about something. Now, this girl with the baby is under her mother's insurance policy and her mother's policy covers all of her medical expenses and as a gift to you, she would like to cover all the medical. Is that all right with you? <laughs> Out of the whole thing, we paid a couple of court fees. And we brought Deborah home from the hospital and today she is the joy of my life and the mother of my grandson. Lord. Now, here's the point. Often in times of transition, God is looking to do amazing things among you. This can be a time of miracles but you have to consecrate yourselves. You have to ask, seek, and knock. You have to take a step of faith. Step out and get your feet wet. Amen. And then watch what God can do. Amen. Number four. Transitions require trusting God to get you through. Transitions require trusting God to get you through. The priests who carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stopped in the middle of the Jordan and stood on dry ground while all the, of Israel passed by until the whole nation had completed the crossing on dry ground. I want you to see what's happening here. The priests moved out on Joshua's command, carrying the Ark of the Covenant, the presence of God. The river was at flood stage, which means it was a raging torrent. And the priests walked right up to the edge, and then they walked out into the water. Did they get swept away? Quite the opposite. Somewhere way upstream, God caused the flow of the river to be cut off. The word of God says that the water stood up in a heap. And so with the flow cut off, very soon the raging river in front of them completely dried up, allowing the priests and all the people to cross the riverbed on dry ground. In all those millions of people, no one had crossed out of Egypt through the Red Sea on dry ground except Joshua and Caleb. Everyone else had perished in the wilderness. They had all heard the stories of God's previous miracle at the sea, but this was their miracle. They saw the river dry up and disappear before their eyes. The God who brought them out was bringing them in. And don't miss what the priests did. They went out into the riverbed ahead of the people. But halfway across, they stopped and they stood there in the middle. And all of the people followed and then passed around them to the other side. And when every soul had passed by the ark, the priests followed up as their rear guard. The presence of the Lord, represented by the Ark of the Covenant, went out before them to lead them and then followed up behind them as well. How many of you all know that the Lord is your rear guard? 
prophet Isaiah said, For you shall not go out in haste, and you shall not go in flight, for the Lord will go before you, and the God of Israel will be your rear guard. And again, then shall your light break forth like the dawn, and your healing shall spring up speedily. Your righteousness shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. And finally, number five. Transitions lead to testimonies of God's faithfulness. Transitions lead to testimonies of God's faithfulness. Go out before the ark of the Lord your God into the middle of the Jordan. Each of you is to take up a stone on his shoulder according to the number of the tribes of the Israelites to serve as a sign among you. The men of Israel were given very specific instructions to do something while they were crossing over One man from each of the 12 tribes was to pick up a stone from the riverbed. Now, we don't know how big a stone it was, but he was instructed to carry it on his shoulders. So I'm assuming a pretty good sized stone. And then when he had crossed over to the other side in what would be their new land... They would stack the stones one upon the other to make what is called a cairn. And a cairn is simply a uh, stack of stones that serves as a marker, uh, a memorial. And this would be a permanent marker of the exact site where God miraculously dried up the river to let the children of Israel cross over on dry ground. Now, the wonderful thing about gravity and Newton's first law of motion that objects at rest tend to stay at rest is if you build a cairn of stones it will most likely stay in that one spot for hundreds of years and one can imagine that for generations Every time a traveling family went by the river at that spot, fathers would get to tell their children, you see that marker? This is the exact place where the Lord God, the God of all the earth, dried up the river miraculously and allowed our forefathers to come across on dry ground to enter into this land, our land which he had promised to Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob to give to them. This time of transition can lead to a testimony of God's faithfulness. And remember that we all go through times of transition all our lives. There are happy and joyous transitions, graduations, marriages, the birth of children, new jobs, even cross-country moves. And some are difficult, fraught with concern, and some are even tragic. Job loss, hurricanes, Diseases and death. And you know what? Sometimes pastors leave or retire. And a church has to start a new chapter in their life as a family of faith. And we can wring our hands and we can worry and we can conspire together and we can rely completely on the flesh. I've seen churches do that. Or we can humble ourselves and pray. And seek God's face. And turn from our wicked ways. We can consecrate ourselves. We can step out in faith and see the wonders that the Lord will do for us. We can trust him to see us through. 
And when we have crossed over, we'll all have a testimony of God's faithfulness. Let's pray together. God, I thank you today for your word. I thank you that it has clear instructions, scriptural principles that we can apply to our lives. And like every time we hear the word, we can hear it and not do anything about it. And think that just because we heard it, that's something. But the Bible says, then we're only deluding ourselves. It is only when we become an effectual doer and put it into practice that we'll be blessed in all our ways. So I pray, God, that each and every one of us in our own way will take the word that we have heard today and say, I'm going to do that word. I'm going to obey, not the preacher, who cares? I'm going to obey the word of God. And I'm going to ask the Holy Spirit to give me the strength and the grace to walk this out. And I'm going to consecrate myself. And I'm going to dedicate myself to the Lord God and to my family. And I'm going to trust God and look for miracles. And I thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Um, just a few very short things uh, before we close. A simple reminder of our earlier announcement that um, uh, Sunday the 20th, we'll have a special called business meeting following the worship service um, to present the 2023 budget, and it will be voted on at our regular quarterly business meeting the 3rd of December. If you're all interested in membership and uh, uh, want to sign up for the membership class, signing up just lets us know that you're coming and we can make sure we have enough materials prepared in advance. Uh, that is also the, uh, no, I'm sorry. Sunday is the 4th of December. That's the business meeting. The 3rd of December, the Saturday, that's when we're having the membership class. So uh, be signing up if you're interested. Probably don't have to tell any of you that Tuesday is election day. Do your civic duty. Pray and then go vote. All right? Praise God. Praise God. All right. Bob's going to have our benediction and then we're going to have a doxology. All right. Please stand for the benediction. Wasn't that a great sermon? Amen. Amen. Please bow your heads. Dear Holy Father, please shine your light upon us. Lighten our path. Make us strong. Give us courage. Let us not be discouraged as we move forward because we know our Lord, our God, will be with us every step. I pray this in Christ's name. In his name, everything is possible. Amen. Amen. And as we prepare for the doxology, I'd just like to remind you that food donations will be due um, next Sunday, November 13th. So if you could stop by the Giving Tree to pick up an uh, item. We're asking that you bring that in because our donations are going to be given to the families on the 22nd. The rest of the information is in your bulletin, so I won't repeat that. Lord is my shepherd. I have all I need. Our doxology, please.
leads me beside the still waters along. Restore it, my soul, in my heart there's a song. The Lord is my shepherd, he gave me a goal. All days of my life I have peace in my soul. His hand leads me onward with patience and love, and I'll dwell forever in God's home above. Amen. Amen.